Good morning, everyone. My name is Vera Quijano, but for this lecture, I'm going to be impersonating Professor Vera Quijano. Because um, how many here would rather learn a salsa dance lesson? Because yeah. <laughs> I know how to do that. But this is the first time I'm using this, and that's my first flash drive, and here's my first uh, have at it. So welcome, everyone. Today we're talking about bones role in calcium homeostasis. So at the end of this lecture, students are expected to be able to. Expected. Look at that word. And uh, just a little preface here before, um, I think the disadvantage to watching all of your lectures so far, I went in, I changed a whole bunch of stuff. And <laughs> I had to do this until 9 o'clock at night. And then I started looking at this, at, at my learning outcomes, and I realized a couple of things. So number one, describe the importance of calcium in the body. Calcium is very important. Explain how blood calcium level is regulated. And what you can't see here is that I have an invisible ink down there. There's two more. <laughs> you can't read them, though, from there. We need to calcitonin. Describe how calcitonin's role in blood calcium regulation. Oopsie. That's wrong. So calcitonin. Can you read that from there? And then calcitriol. That's right there. You just can't see it's invisible. And that's invisible there. So you're welcome for deciphering that for you. Did that go? OK. So why is calcium important in the human body? I love this, this image from Martini. Notice skeletal, muscular, nervous, and endocrine system are listed up there. Most abundant minerals. So we have all kinds of minerals that are dietary needs for minerals. And calcium is a major mineral, meaning that it is one of the minerals that's required in your body greater than 100 milligrams every day. It is the one that you, you, we need the most of calcium. For an adult male, you need 100, 1,000 milligrams a day. And for adult female, we need about 1,200 milligrams a day. So it's something your body doesn't make it. It's essential, right? We talked about essential, right? It is important for skeletal muscle contraction, nerve impulse transmission, bone formation and strength, and we're going to talk about the thyroid and parathyroid. We haven't touched on the endocrine system yet, so that is something that we'll talk about later, in, not in depth. And I think it was, uh, see how it's a different title? Why else is calcium important in the body? <laughs> So Landcraft isn't here. So that's, this is right. This is, falls within his rules here. So I, now this is a different image here with respiratory, digestive, urinary, and cardiovascular system. Co cofactor for enzymes and proteins. Normal blood clotting. It's really important in coagulation. Mediation of vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Cardiac muscle contraction. This is very important to have calcium in the body, and people really wonder about, oh, am I getting enough calcium, and how do we really know this? Something that I thought, I didn't realize this until I went through all the notes putting this together, you could go into cardiac arrest if your calcium levels are too low, and if the rest, into respiratory rest if your levels are too high. So it's important to get this into your body. So Professor Ron here already talked about some of the skeletal system, but what we're, one of the six main functions is mineral homeostasis but we are focusing on calcium homeostasis. That's the focus of this topic today, hopefully. We're able to stay focused. So what is calcium homeostasis? It's the storage and release of critical calcium levels on demand. So we're constantly bombarding our bodies with all the stuff, you know, flaming hot Cheetos and, and stuff that's not good, and, we, and we're, our bodies are constantly trying to get the levels right. And this is regulated by an antagonistic relationship between osteoblasts, which build bone, and osteoclasts, which do the other thing. Right? That's where I'm at now. It's just whatever the other thing is. I'm trying to remember just one thing at a time. This is something to think about right away and just keep this in mind. So this is a what are the critical blood calcium levels, according to this one particular book. So... It is important that blood calcium levels stay between 9 and 11 milligrams per, per 100 milliliters. That is a pretty short range that is considered to be you know, good, that right. 
And keep in mind, bone tissue and teeth store like 98, 99% of the calcium. That's, that's where most of it's supposed to be. And 1% is in the soft tissue and in the blood. So that is, that's what, what we're always talking about here. And I'm just going to put this up here because we're going to go back to this on, um, in a, at the end here. So you have to remember this. And you will be tested on this. You will. You will. And yeah, just kidding. Not really. Well, maybe. 9 to 11 milligrams per 100 mils is your goal, okay? That is in the blood, okay? So keep that in mind. That's that 1% in the blood. We already know this. And there's that what Professor Ron here was talking about, that scary-looking uh, osteoclast. It is pretty creepy and mean-looking. But just a quick reminder, osteoblasts, build bone, osteoclasts are chipping it away. And that's a scanning electron micrograph up at 8,000 for the blast and 2,700 for the clast. Keep those in mind. We're going to go back to those, back to those, back to those, back to those. Did I say that enough? So hopefully you can't read any of that print from the back because I don't want you to read it. I just want you to look at the shape, <laughs> shape of this very, very fun feedback loop, fun time. So I just, so I put that 9 to 11 milligrams per 100 mils there on purpose. And we're going to look at both situations, and I'm going to go to the top situation first. So just note at the top of this slide, we are looking at when the ca blood calcium levels get too high. Okay, this is too high. So you see how this lever is going up. So the, the, the calcium in the blood is too high. So I don't know how it got there, but I'm just going to give a little scenario to as to maybe how it got there. Do you know what day today is? July what? 31. Do you know what happens at 31 Flavors on July 31st? <laughs> you get free ice cream or they're dollar thirty one. Yeah. You could go and if you have a live in a town where a lot of towns are together, you could stop at every Baskin Robbins and get uh, on the thirty first of any month and you can get ice cream for that improve your calcium. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this, thank yeah. you. This is why we're gonna all remember this forever. Because what I want you to remember is thirty one flavors, and again it's a story. I don't know if this really happened, maybe it does, but I don't know. But think of 31 flavors and the thyroid gland. The, the. Ah. Okay. So we're looking at levels got too high. Lori knows about the 31 flavors thing. She talked to me, and we went down the road. And we just ate every kind. Mint chip first. And then, right? We went down, and we got a whole bunch of cow. I don't know how the calcium levels got that. So we're not talking about this, but we're talking about that the situation is hypercalcemia. There's too much calcium in the blood. And your body's super smart. And this thyroid gland, which is right here, located at your neck, you can't really, it's soft tissue, it's below, just inferior to the voice box. The parafollicular cells, they detect this condition and they can secrete calcitonin. I purposely put calcitonin above that center line. So you see the levels are too high and that calcitonin is secreted by the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. Thyroid, 31 flavors, levels are too high. So this is what happened. And what, what happens from there? The calcitonin stimulates the calcium salt deposit into the bone. And those beautiful, wonderful osteoblasts are signaled to remove the calcium from the blood. So what's happening? All that, that calcium that's in the blood starts coming out because that osteoblast starts packing it into bone. And then you're back to homeostasis. That level just goes through, down, done, we're happy again until the 31st of the next month. <laughs> okay? So that is the situation with too high. So that's all you have to remember for that is calcitonin. It's more, it's more in depth with the, the other way around. So here's, now we're looking at the other situation. This is a pretty dire situation. So really think about what happens when blood calcium levels are falling. That is, there's a lot of issues with that, and, there's a, and the response is, is multi. It's better, it's a, there's a better response, because I think it's a more dire response that your body needs, and your body's really smart. So on the posterior side of the thyroid gland, there's the parathyroid. 
And parathyroid secretes one hormone, parathyroid hormone. So that hormone is secreted when the levels are falling. And you're in the condition of hypocalcemia, low blood calcium. So you're below, getting below that 1%, right? And what kicks in there? Come on, Ron. <laughs> I could call on him here because he knows that guy. It's, a, it's the... Par- it's the osteoclast. So it, we have to get that, that um, we have to get those levels up. The levels are too low. We've got to start chipping away from that bone and get that, that, blood, that uh, bone back into the, the calcium out of there. So this is the, one of the things the smart, smart parathyroid hormone does is it targets those osteoclasts. But there's something else it does, and it's, it'll activate uh, vitamin D. And this is, so in addition to the parathyroid hormone targeting those osteoclasts, it'll activate vitamin D, and it converts it to the the active form calcitriol, which I put on the bottom there just for a visual when the levels are low. And that does that in the kidneys. It reduces the calcium loss in the kidneys through the urine, I'm sorry, via the urine. That makes sense? It doesn't stop there. It also activates calcium absorption from the small intestine. So it knows to do this bringing in from when you're in your diet, it'll start detecting that and it'll start drawing that back in and try to get those levels back to where they should be. So three smart things in that level when the levels are low, one thing when the levels are high. This is important to look at for aging in bone tissue. I was recently in a car accident. I had, and there was a, I got an X-ray, and I, I got an MRI, and I was asking about something, and the doctor said, "Well, it looks like that because of your age." I'm like, "What? Like this is <laughs> this sucks?" <laughs> right? But I really thought this is a aging in bone tissue. This is a very important issue, something to think about. Principal effect of aging is demineralization, and because it, I mean it is not a good situation. This image here is of a, a fracture of hip fracture, and it's a very common thing to have hip fractures, wrist fractures, other and, back, and bone fractures from falls, due to reduced osteoblast activity. It's not the bones not building, but maybe you know I don't, what is the reason? How to get there? I'm not sure. But this is a situation, it's very common. Osteopenia, that loss of bone mass, that's detected from, you know, you could, most people know about this, I'll I'll talk about that on the next slide. And then osteoporosis, it's a cause of more than one and a half million fractures a year. That's, uh, That's serious. And usually, especially with elderly people, when you fall, you end up in a home or you end up, it's not a good situation to be in. So that's one of the reasons you should take yoga, balance. This is what this looks like. This is a scanning electron micrograph of normal bone, and then this is, uh, this is um, osteoporosis, 30 times blown up. It affects, in this country, 10 million people a year in the U.S. alone. But look at the, and look, the osteoclast outpaces the osteoblast. So it's chipping away more than it's building. Bad situation to get in. But osteopenia, even worse, it's another 18 million people with low bone mass. So it's something, and it's something you really have to take seriously, I think, with calcium, especially with those first slides, how much it affects so many different systems. Rates of bone mineralization, male versus female. Male begins after age 60. Lucky. Once it begins, 3% bone mass loss every 10 years. Look how unfair you guys are. (laughs) Who planned this? Female bone mineralization begins at age 30. You thought you were all just fine at 29, 30, tanking. It goes, the loss (laughs) rate goes down. And it accelerates around age 45. Why does it do that? More fun, right? (laughs) Yes, those estrogen levels, they tank also. So what happens with this age 30, I mean, eight, about 30% lost by age 70. Look at the comparison, about 8% bone mass loss every 10 years. Look at what the males is. We're about three to, almost three times worse off. It really freaks me out, it? but it's something that we should um, think about seriously, which I'm going to show you in a slide after this, of one way we could just look at this. So this is actually what I want to talk about. Super fun fact. 
This person is my hero. Quick read. Who knows the answer? His son taught at San Francisco State when I was uh, doing my pre-med there. So one person's been awarded two unshared Nobel Prizes, and it is Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling of, I know this is a lot of text. Linus Pauling founded the Linus Pauling Institute. Menlo Park is five minutes from where I live. But after he died, he died, just, I think, in 94 or so. And they have, there's a Linus Pauling Institute. I'm just giving this as a fun fact. You should write this down. Linus Pauling Institute. You should because it's a great referral. And I think it's good as A&P instructors that we should let our students know about this. They use the evidence-based approach to determine functional roles of micronutrients. So we talk about carbohydrates and what were good fats and people, different people talk about vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals, plant chemicals. They rule, you could see, you could see this institute looks at these and, and actually for optimal health, disease prevention, treatment, and reversing of aging. It's really interesting, all scientists looking at these, because a lot of students will say, oh, they'll ask for medical advice. I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving medical advice. But you know what? You could go look up some stuff here on your own. We could tell our students. I do tell my students that. So Linus Pauli Institute is something you should know. Here's another one to write down before I go into this. Another thing to write down, and, uh, and just because we've talked about so many of this, so much, sorry this is so down low, consumerlab.com, it's just something I, I uh, signed up with, it's, um, I don't know, it's like $35 a year or something, I don't know what it is, I'm not affiliated with it, but what they do, they're like consumer reports, and they will look at all different kinds of, of supplements, and they will do independent studies on them, see if they're absorbed, because people say, oh, I took this much calcium, but they'll show a study, like, oh, you took the X brand calcium, well, that one ends up, doesn't dissolve. Or you took this brand, right? Oh, yeah, Paulina, well, yeah, she's a nat. Doesn't it make you crazy? So this is a really good, good reference. I'm not my mother, talking to my mother, oh my gosh, this is not on tape. <laughs> Strike that part out, my mom. <laughs> but she said, you have to take this. I said, Mom, did you read this thing? So I just accept it and walk away. And Anyway, so checkpoint review. I don't know if I put anything after I didn't. So I'm just going to ask you, you can read this. Can you read the back? You can't read this. Okay, good. So the situation up at the top. Imbalance, it's too high, right? You got the thyroid gland. What are the cells that are activated here? What do we need? I'm sorry, let me make a, my sentence, let me be more clear. So this, this situation here, we're coming around, our friendly cells here. Right. We have too much calcium is in the blood. We have too much. It's going above 1%. We've got to get that out of the blood, pack it onto the bone. So it's the other one on the bottom. <laughs> And then there's another situation. So we know this is a dire situation. Here and here. What other two? We've got vitamin D that's activated into calcitriol. And what does calcitriol do? There's one, what's one situation? There's two things. There is the two other places where it'll help bring those. Reabsorption in the kidney. Kidneys. And more absorption in the gut. And the, the gut. Kidney and the gut. You get an A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who oh, wants to open it up? I'll do it. I'm uh, going to take notes. Actually, my comment is on this slide. I love the teeter-totter kind of uh, imbalance in the middle, the between two feedback loops. I'm going to steal that concept. That made sense to me. That was out of a lot of them that I looked at. Thank you. It looks like the taste of that 3130. <laughs> I really like how you split the feedback loops up. Feedback loops in my brain are not friends. Me. I look at them and I'm like, and I hate making them because they just don't make sense to me. But when you broke it in half and you walked us through it, it made total sense. That was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. That made me remember. I didn't remember until I did this. Yeah.
I have to yes. say you did a wonderful job incorporating all of the suggestions that have been made throughout mm -hmm. yesterday. I mean, I don't know what your presentation was prior, but clearly all the suggestions that have made, even through this morning with regards to the board and the black, large print. Mm -hmm. Great job. Thank you. I, I loved your energy, and you were very, the, your, your excitement about the topic, because that's contagious. Just like when you're up there and not having a good time, that's contagious too. But you, you, you know, you draw your audience in very well, so you were very effective in that. Thank you. I think you did a really good job of making it relevant to real life, mm -hmm. because that is a, an issue, especially in older people. And I know that at a young age, in college age, especially in the 30s, no one is really thinking about it at all. Yeah, they don't realize it. But that is a very good connection to a real life situation. You know, even in, when I teach yoga, I think what makes it relevant, I'll ask that my students, you know, when we're balanced flexibility strength exercises, and I incorporate A and P, I'll ask how any of your parents, your mom and dad, uncle, have this situation. Well, how, do we want to be that way? What can we do to prevent just making this real life um, a connection? Kev, you want to start? Yeah. <clears throat> um, the, uh, I didn't realize my skeleton was in such good shape as a male. Um, <laughs> but right? females live a lot longer than males, so <laughs> there's that. Uh, so maybe it comes out in the wash, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but that is a good, you know, that is, you can bring in applications there as well. I mean, you didn't have a lot of time, but you know, movement, continuing movement and weight bearing as we age can mitigate a lot of right. that loss. So, you know, assuming you're not having an actual pathology like osteoporosis or something. So that's good. But I really liked your engagement with the whole class. I mean, you really hit all the buttons. I mean, you had, you made good eye contact. You were eliciting, you know, feedback or um, reactions from us and so on. You were... Um, bringing in um, not only planned things like Linus Pauling and, you know, that led back to your topic here, but then you, you know, something else occurred to you and you wrote it in there. And those kinds of things where you're bringing them in, sometimes just on the fly, like, oh, yeah, there's this other thing. Um, that really, I mean, it not, not only the general principle of that helps students engage with the topic, but the fact that you're so enthused about it and that you have this broader knowledge in that, that also makes students want to learn more about the whole thing. So I thought that was really great. And this is a, um, this is a topic that can really turn students off because, you know, it's, you know, one of their first, um, you know, applications of homeostasis. They had it back in chapter one or two. Mm -hmm. And uh, th they've kind of left it alone this whole time, and now we're at, you know, first big application of it. And it's a fairly complex one because it involves two different feedback loops. So not only are we revisiting feedback loops, but we're also doing two of them, and they're interconnected. Um, and so how, how am I going to present that? And you did that very well. And, uh, oh my gosh, now hormones are involved, and we haven't been to the endocrine system yet, but just the idea of hormones freaks people out, I think, sometimes, because they just seem so mysterious. Well, even to me now, they still seem very mysterious. <laughs> they are. It can be intimidating, because as I speak, probably a new hormone has been discovered somewhere, and probably affects calcium. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, I really like the way you put it all together and really made it flow and really made it understandable. One last thing real quick, based on a comment that was made about feedback loops being hard to understand, that is a common situation, and I really recommend, and I wish I remembered the name of the, the book, but uh, Jenny McFarland, who's an acquaintance of mine, she's one of the co-authors, I think it might be Harold Modell, uh, M-O-D-E-L-L, might be the lead author on a on a um, article. I think it's in... Whatever the physiology, uh, American Physiological Society, their education journal, uh, teaching. Oh gosh, I should know this. Anyway, um, they did an they did a study of what's the best way to represent a feedback loop um, that's most understandable to most people, and they came up with one that is different than you'll see in most textbooks. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, at the last HAPS conference, Jenny McFarland <laughs> was going around looking at all the textbooks saying, no, that's not it, no, that's not it, no, that's not it. So none of us have the one that she thinks it should be, but her idea is based on um, some research that was done. So hers kind of goes across rather than is a loop. Uh, although I think that's odd to represent a loop as a line, but um, you know she has some evidence. So it's worth looking at. I mean, I don't use their method because I have some issues with it, but uh, it really helped me understand better how people approach diagrams like that, and it helps in teaching. So a little um, reading assignment. Okay, that's all I got. Frank? I'm trying to look up the journal. Is it advances in Ad physiology? Advances in physiology education. Oh, I found yeah, it. Car Carol Modell, William Cliff. If anybody finds it, can you post it on the? Um, yeah, that sounds right. Okay. In the practicum page on D2O. Oh, okay. I mean, Harold Modell has published a lot of articles in there. Oh, so one of the students. Make sure it's the one about feedback loops. Physiologist for UFO misdeeds. Yeah, if you can post uh, it. I'll find it too. If you can't find okay. it, I'll. Get it. So while this may have been the first time that you presented A and P, purely A and P uh, content, it's obvious that you've had some presenting experience. Yeah, it's Whether not it's PowerPoint. Not PowerPoint, yeah. right. But, so it showed, good, and that was that's a good thing. And it showed well. Um, I like when an instructor recognizes the not just the complexity of the body, but the, shall we say, innate intelligence using chiropractic, a term that's used commonly in chiropractic. Um, one of my mentors made this statement. Let's see if I can get it right the first time. The body is smarter than we think, and the body is smarter than we can think. Think about that. Uh, <laughs> it will, we'll likely never know everything that goes on in the body. So giving it the respect of, of that intelligence uh, is a wise thing to do. And as Dr. Germano said earlier, the body does things for a reason and works very much on stimulus and response. Just because we don't agree with, with the response, maybe we just don't understand what the stimulus is and how to change it. So, other thing that um, you brought up about osteoblast and osteoclast and the other thing, the one does the other thing, <laughs> I, I can relate to that because you get students and you know they know there's two things that happen, and there's two cells that do it, and they do the opposite of each other. If they understand that, all they need to know is one of them. That's the gift of the brain injury. Yeah. <laughs> so, it really yeah. is. You just do one, and now the one's the other thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, that's, and that's okay. Right. Because then you can get them, try and remember both, you can get them mixed up. But also the benefit of using the letter B and the letter C as a cue as cues uh, can work as well. The other point, I'm going to make a recommendation or something for you to consider. The same with Ron, when he had one figure that he didn't want you to focus on something and you had the small print in the feedback loop. I'm going to have you think of the, not think of the color blue. <laughs> Exactly. What's well, the first, thing, exactly what's the first thing that comes to mind? Right. Blue. Yeah, exactly. All right. That's the first thing you think about. Don't look at this. Right. What's the first thing they're going to do? Look okay. at that. All right. So say, let's focus here. On the shape. Or, or, right. or that smaller print I'm going to show you enlarged on the next slide. So keep it in that mind frame. Okay. The other thing you could do is just white out those that small print. Yes. And I did that throughout this. I don't yeah. have any of those skills, so I have patches of white that yep. I just the fine. Just over. You just take a white box, yes. mm -hmm. create a box, and yeah. change it to a white color, 
and just put it over that fine print, especially if you're going to cover it later. Uh, I also like your use of the whiteboard. And something wasn't on the presentation and you wanted to add, you put it on the whiteboard, and that's a okay. I also like that you took the time to restate a question. You, you thought about the way you said it and you restated it. And that's, that's a sign that you're aware of what you're presenting. When you say, and let me make that a little more clear for you. That was Lori looking like, what are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and that's good that you, you, read, you read the students' faces and you use that as feedback. Also like that you did the disclaimer. Uh, you know, not an MD, but I play one on TV. Um, <laughs> and you know, I don't have any affiliation with this product, but it's something I wanted to share with you if you're interested. I, I like that you did that, so students understand where you are in relation to these various topics and products. Mm -hmm. It is a very smart resource. It's something I do recommend looking to, just as a instructors. So, but overall, well done for first time presenting in this format. So going last, I don't have much to add. You did a great job. Uh, one comment, uh, piggybacking on what Kevin said, is that there's a couple of times in AMP1 where you have to explain something utilizing the body system that you haven't covered yet. So in this case, you haven't covered an endocrine system yeah. yet, but you did a really nice job of just giving them the basics. Of, uh, of how that works. The next time it comes up is with skeletal muscle physiology where you haven't covered the nervous system. Right? So if you kind of keep that in mind and just just you know let them know we haven't like you did, we haven't covered the endocrine system yet, but you know there's the a glands and this, they'll, they'll produce these hormones, chemical messages in the blood, just enough so they understand the process because it, it could get a little tricky there, uh, which you did a great job with. The other tidbit of advice is just go back to one of your earlier slides. This is kind of for everybody. I make this recommendation in 5110, um, like your first or second slide. Actually. So there's outcomes. That one. No, next one. <laughs> you see, this one had the phone maybe on the, the right, slide, and then the, the phone first slide. On the left. First slide, maybe. So anyway, it's it's right there. So. Um, this will save you a lot of work if you haven't taught yet and you're, and you're uh, compiling your PowerPoints in this program here, is to go back, and I make this recommendation in 5110, go back and remove all the section numbers, references to page numbers, books, or even chapter numbers from all your PowerPoint slides because chances are you're not going to teach from that book and it's going to confuse the students. Right. Right? Every once in a while I'll come across, well, I'll pr I probably have most of them cleaned up by now, but. I used to come across something, or I'll have on there, see table on page, blah, blah, blah. Even if you're working on the same textbook, you have to keep an eye on that because they're newer editions. But definitely go back and just take out all of that stuff. Any, anything that specifically references the textbook. That, that's why when students first start submitting the PowerPoints to me in 5110, you know, they'll start by you know, uh, Martini 1.1 to 1.4, and I tell them, take, take that out because you're going to you're going to have to go back and, and redo that anyway. So just a little tidbit of advice for everybody. Otherwise, very, very good.